Okay, and now I'd like to welcome here uh, Marek Rosa, who is the CEO and CTO at uh, Good AI Company and also Keen Software House Company. And he will tell us about uh, developing universal artificial intelligence. Thank you. Uh, so I will introduce uh, our project, uh, which is called Good AI, and I will also speak a little bit about me and uh, how I get to this and how we want to do this general AI thing. So I was interested in AI since, uh, since the childhood, and as a programmer, I had two directions. One was programming, uh, gaming, uh, gaming programming, render stuff, physics, and so on, and the other was AI. And it was maybe 20 years ago, and uh, I decided to follow the gaming path because I knew that there I can make money and be independent and then go back to AI and start working on AI. And this finally happened to me uh, two years ago, when uh, we got some success in games and so on, and I was able to start funding the Good AI project myself. And uh, started to hire slowly people. Uh, there is about 30 people in the, in the Good AI at this moment, uh, software engineers, researchers, and so on. And uh, uh, the idea uh, is that uh, we don't know how long this project will take. It can take years, it can de take decades. So basically, I really needed to prepare a huge amount of money to put it there so we can sustain for a long period of time and just keep adding to this money every year so we can prolong the, this, uh, this runway. And uh, another thing uh, what I try to do is that since we are developing general AI and if we will be successful, then basically all my colleagues will, be, will lose their job because I will not need them anymore because the general AI will be able to do their job. So that's why I want to make them like uh, co-owners in the company so they have stock options and stuff like that. So they, don't become that, so they are not actually digging their own graves. Uh, our motto is develop general uh, artificial intelligence, be helpful to humanity, and um, understand the universe. And the last one, understand the universe, is basically the main motivation behind this entire thing, because we all are very curious about how this universe works, uh, what it is actually, and so on. And we think that the best way how to find answers to this question is to build AGI that is smarter than we are, and together find these answers. And there is uh, one more thing, and uh, it's uh, develop uh, general AI as fast as possible, so we really don't want to waste time by prolonging this process. And we understand that every day we don't have this general AI, we're actually losing a lot of stuff, many opportunities or many, many things. So let's say that with general AI, uh, we can cure many, uh, many diseases, and uh, without general AI, we cannot. So basically every day you don't have general AI and the solutions it can provide, we are kind of like killing um, thousands of people. So the difference between general AI and narrow AI, uh, it's, uh, for some people it's not really relevant, for some people it's more relevant. Uh, I think it's more like philosophical thing because if you will set yourself a goal that you want to build general AI, then you really go for a long run and you don't accept short-term uh, narrow AI solutions. And you really want to understand the theory behind intelligence and principles and then build them from the bottom up. So why general AI and why I'm really so much interested in general AI is that for me it's uh, something that has the highest return on investment and I don't mean just financially but even uh, in terms of my own time because instead of uh, making games, I don't like doing some space exploration stuff, some a cure for cancer or many of uh, all these things, I would need to do them in parallel and it's not possible. But if you build AGI at the beginning, then the AGI can do all these things in parallel very easily because it's scalable instead of me. And of course, it's a very high risk uh, project, but that's something I like when you know the, the risk is really high, but the possible or potential reward is also very high. That's my kind of thing. And uh, so what we, uh, what we want to accomplish with, with this is to basically understand intelligence, build uh, AGI, and then, the, the, uh, then let the AGI recursively self-improve itself. And uh, this, this is actually a very important concept, even in the early designs that we have already now, that the, the architecture we are building will be or should be uh, recursively self-improving itself, even while it's still not really AGI. 
And so what we want to achieve with this idea is that uh, not just like build some product and give it to people or something like this, but uh, build AGI or AI scientists, programmers, engineers, and then, you know, just go out and start conquering this universe. That's basically uh, what we want to do. And, uh, but we think that everyone can benefit from uh, AGI uh, if it's done, a, done correctly, because the kind of future we want to build, it's not about who will be, you know, like the, the dictator of the universe or something like this, but it's actually like totally irrelevant. The, the thing is that we want to build something that's so effective and optimal in uh, controlling the future and uh, maximizing future options and things like this, that uh, like who control, controls these things is so irrelevant and so small problem that it doesn't matter at this moment. It will matter until we get there, but after that point, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, so, but in the short term, there will be some effects on a uh, job market and on people and so on. And I, I'm sure that m many of you or most of you are uh, aware of this. And the point is that as we will be getting there, narrow AI uh, stuff will be replacing some people. Uh, at the beginning, it will not be so dramatic because these people will just take another jobs and so on. But eventually, if you imagine that if we go to general AI that will be uh, capable to do same things as people, and even better, then there is really no point in employing people. If the machine can do the same job as you can do, then and uh, it's just mo more, much more economical, efficient, then it will just, uh, any company will rather use uh, machines than, uh, than people. So uh, there are some solutions to this. Uh, one of those that we can see in, uh, in media and so on is uh, this basic income, which basically will mean that uh, governments will give some basic income to every person. Uh, I don't think this is a, a long-term solution. I think it's just a short-term because uh, it's a for a long uh, discussion. But basically, in my opinion, it's like really wrong allocation of resources. And but at the same time, uh, we don't want to just like let people, you know, uh, lose uh, their income and so on. So uh, we are thinking about some other options. And one of them is that if uh, governments or people will be able to invest in AI or AGI companies and then share the dividends in the future, that's one of the solutions uh, how we can overcome this thing. But anyway, uh, the best way how to secure or how to maximize your chance of securing your um, position in this future, in this AGI future, is to actually build AGI. And that's one of the reasons why we are really uh, working hard on this. Uh, so. Uh, as part of our research, we are really trying to understand what is intelligence, wh what are the principles of intelligence, and uh, I'm, I'm aware that many of you uh, kind of know this or are aware of this. And uh, so in our opinion, it's an ability or it's a mechanism or tool that is modeling the uh, outside environment and also inside environment, modeling it with less parameters than the uh, real environment. And if it is with less parameters, it's actually easier to find solutions on these models that have uh, less parameters. And one of the examples I'm using is comparison between evolution and intelligence. If you look on them as some kind of optimization strategies or alg algorithms. So evolution is trying to find some optimal solutions in the real world, which has like a huge amount of parameters, and uh, evolution can use abstractions and shortcuts and all these things. So every new solution takes many, many years and a lot of resources to find. On the other side, if you look on intelligence, intelligence will try to model the same stuff with less parameters, use shortcuts, abstractions, generalizations, predictions, and many other uh, mechanisms and will be able to achieve, let's say, similar or better uh, results much faster and especially with less resources. And this kind of, uh, this uh, limited resources is very important concept in our research because everything we do, we actually put in the, in the, uh, we look on it from this limited uh, resources point of view. And uh, when you are doing optimization, you always need to look on uh, how much resources you are using and if you cannot do it better. And there is also another principle, uh, and this principle goes through entire architecture from all to, to, through all scales, from the agent to different modules to individual neurons, and is that each unit uh, has some goal, which comes from the outside, has some time and some resources. And basically it is trying to uh, ex estimate or predict what, it will, what, what its future goals will be, prepare for this, 
uh, in some, let's say, unsupervised way. So when some actual goal will come, the unit will be ready to deliver this goal as fast as possible and with as uh, few uh, resources and, and as possible. Uh, so, uh, in our research, uh, we have two main directions. One is building a universal brain architecture, and the other is a school for AI. So, now I will speak a little bit about the yeah, unified brain architecture. We are building it. You can think about it like some uh, huge uh, network of, let's say, neurons, and uh, uh, it should be growing, which means that we are not starting with a set amount of uh, neurons that are just trained, but we actually want something that is uh, compositionally adding new and new skills, adding new and new neurons to this, to this network. That's a really short description of uh, what we want to achieve. And uh, we are not building this by connecting existing uh, machine learning uh, technologies together. We are aware of these things, we are studying them, but we are also taking inspiration from neuroscience, neurobiology, psychology, and all these other uh, fields, and trying to understand theory behind the intelligence and then build it from the, from the bottom up. So that's something I wanted to emphasize because sometimes people think that we are just putting together you know, existing tools or something like that. And uh, in this uh, unified brain architecture, there are a few, a few topics that we uh, study. One of them is what we call intrinsic properties. And basically, these will be the properties of this architecture that we need to implement. Th they just need to be in the design. Then there is another, which are learned abilities or general abilities. And these abilities, we want uh, the AI agent to learn by interacting with the school. I will get to this later. So a few of these intrinsic uh, properties. Uh, one of the most important is uh, something we call additive learning or incremental learning or compositional learning. So it's the ability to actually stack up or add up uh, uh, different skills, different knowledge experience, one on another, replace you know, uh, new uh, old experience with a new experience that is, let's say, much more optimal and so on. And we are starting with this, uh, with this ability. It's the one of the most challenging things that we actually are doing right now, because if you, are st if you start adding neurons to, to a neural network, it really gets crazy. So, uh, but we think this is very important, and uh, later I will explain why. Another uh, important intrinsic property side are that what we want is online learning, so it should be real learning as it's going as people. Then it should be uh, lifelong or uh, perpetual learning, which means that there is no training and testing period. It's just always, always in training and testing, let's say. And then, of course, there are many, many other things. Uh, something about these uh, learned abilities. Uh, so you can think about them as when this AI will go through the school for AI, it will learn uh, through learning task uh, one ability after another ability and then just stack them up. And instead of programming these learned abilities or hard coding them, we want the agent to actually discover the strategies, how to achieve these abilities and then stack them up one after another, maybe replace older strategies with the better strategies and so on. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to implement or hard code these, uh, these uh, abilities. So a few of them could be like feature selection. So for example, the agent should actually learn how to do better feature selection. And with, a better, with the ability of doing better feature selection, it can, in the next stage or next task, actually find a better ways how to do uh, feature selection and use other mechanisms, other strategies, other tricks, how to learn new stuff much faster, much more efficient. And then, of course, there are the actual uh, learned skills, like the, the knowledge that the agent will do in some, some environment. And this is just some, some simple example. So now I'm going to the School for AI. And uh, the idea behind the School for AI is that uh, we want uh, this agent to, to learn gradually in a guided way. And the reason for this is that we want to narrow the exploration space uh, the agent will need to explore while he will be learning the knowledge about the world. And uh, because if you imagine that even if we get lucky and just develop this uh, unified brain architecture and it's working and, and super cool, if you just throw it somewhere, it will start receiving the input from the environment, but without any guidance, uh, any, 
anyone telling him what is right, what is correct, and how to actually efficiently navigate through the world, uh, the agent would be uh, would need to do a lot of things through trial and error and explore many uh, like a huge space of possibilities that we already know are irrelevant for him. So for this reason, for narrowing the search space, we are implementing a school for AI and. Uh, it's uh, about learning tasks that go one after another, incrementally learn new tasks which are built on top of the previous task and so on. And uh, the funny thing about this school is that it's always changing as, as the, uh, the architecture that we develop some learning tasks and then we realize that we actually need learning tasks that will be before these learning tasks because uh, if you are just going to problems that are too hard, you really will need to use a lot of brute force to solve those problems. But instead, if you, before that, if you learn some skills, which will help you to, f to accomplish these skills much faster, it's just going, uh, uh, it can go much faster. So uh, School for AI is a really ongoing uh, process. And also very good thing is that uh, this architecture and school, they are going in parallel and uh, they are influencing each other in different ways. So we, Im we find out some new task for the school and we realize we need few properties, few new properties or change some properties in the architecture and vice versa that we uh, find out that there should be some mechanism in the, in the intelligence and then we are looking for learning tasks that can actually teach it or that can test this kind of uh, skill. Uh, during our research, uh, we, de we developed uh, our internal tool, we call it Brain Simulator, and it's a CUDA C Sharp uh, tool for visually prototyping these brains and these little architectures and so on. But funny thing is that uh, at this moment we're actually developing a second version which is using different principles and, uh, and so on. And this new version is not called Brain Simulator, it's called Arnold Simulator. Uh, uh, I didn't say much about uh, my gaming stuff and so on, so just quickly, uh, here in Prague I have a company called Kin Software House. We develop a few successful games. One of them is Space Engineers, and actually thanks to Space Engineers I can finance this thing. And uh, so just for fun or kind of like experiment, uh, we made an integration between Brain Simulator and our brains and uh, Space Engineers. So basically it means that uh, some AI in Space Engineers is sending uh, sensory input to Brain Simulator. There, the intelligence is doing its thing and sending back the motoric command. And we can teach the agent do some stuff. But uh, we never actually released this thing or made it publicly uh, because uh, the brain architectures that we had at this moment uh, don't allow some kind of online learning, not online, one-shot learning or some really fast fast learning because it would need many, many uh, training examples to actually learn something. So we are waiting until we develop a better architecture that can learn these incremental skills and then with already trained m brain, we can provide these two players and then they can start training these AIs on top of the skills that we will already provide. So this is basically a sleeping thing. So future ap applications for uh, general AI, the best one is uh, world domination. But until we get there, uh, there are a few other things. And uh, the funny thing about this project is that either we get it like all, I mean, we have general AI and everything is cool. Uh, until we get there, we really will have some kind of dump AIs, you know, not really useful, not really safe. So one of the places where we are planning to put this in business is uh, games, because if you will have uh, AI in games that's kind of stupid or making mistakes, wrong decisions and so on, uh, it cannot kill nobody, you know, it cannot lose money or something like this. So games uh, provide some kind of safe environment for this kind of uh, business. And that's everything. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your talk. And I think you have many questions, so please ask. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe after the previous example, the OK. abilities of the uh, of the artificial intelligence I saw some uh, social skills um, do you plan uh, to do some interaction between the agents I mean so they can learn from each other because you know humans the, um, social learning is a very very important mm -hmm. part of the learning okay so uh, actually
actually we don't plan at this moment uh, like agent to agent kind of communication and the reason would be that we're expecting that the like uh, performance requir requirements even for one agent will be so huge that we just not will not be able to afford two, three, five, and so on. Then. But there will be another agent, us or teacher, you know, and this is uh, how we want to communicate with the AI. So one of the ways how to gradually and guided way teach the agent is to is through the l learning task and just give them reward punishment and so on. But that's a very inefficient way of communication. So uh, like the first step that we want to do is actually teach the agent some simple language. It can be based on English, but super simple. And uh, then using this language, provide much more efficient signal or communication channel to the, to the agent than reward punishment kind of thing. And, uh, but since this question was about social skills, uh, in the future, we actually need, not right now, but in the future, we actually need the agent to develop some social skills uh, in terms of us, to understand our emotions and what, what is important for us and what is not and so on. Otherwise, there will be so many uh, catastrophic failures in the understanding that it will just not be useful. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you, you have some uh, very ambitious goals, and I think that's great. And you've also shown that um, you've made progress when it comes to platforms for testing those goals. Um, have you made any progress when it comes to the artificial intelligence itself? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's uh, really hard to uh, measure progress in our project because most of the time it feels like we actually make one step forward and then like 10 steps backwards, you know. So we are constantly moving backwards, not forward. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, but I think this is really important because uh, sometimes we feel like we actually understand something, but then we really, when we really dig, dig like deep inside this thing, then we realize that there is so much, for example, there was something in our team a couple months ago or half a year ago where everyone was using word generalization, like, you know, like, in machine learning, everyone is using it. But when we actually started to, to, like, to define or started to come to some kind of understanding or like common understanding of what, we, what each of us means by generalization, then really big discussions open. And we found many, many different, uh, I'm not saying like different view or views on generalization, but we go to understand the thing much, much deeper. And this goes to every little uh, intrinsic property that is there and to our roadmap and, and everything like this. That basically, if you already feel like, yeah, it's all clear, you know, like now we just can start doing this thing, then we find out that there are many, many, many other things. But to give you some more practical uh, example or, or like answer, I would say that uh, our progress has been very good in this theoretical side you know, but not that much in practical. That's what, you know, like what we need to do now. Mm -hmm. So have you applied for AI to general natural language understanding? Uh, the thing is that, as I said, like there is so many theory and uh, theories and so many uh, different branches of research in our team that it will not be, it will not work, you know, in, in this way and not at this moment. So uh, until we get to NLP, uh, it will take some time. And since we want to gather in this gradual way and so on, uh, it's, uh, like it's not one of the low hanging fruits you know, that's on our, on our path. We will really need to get there much later uh, when the agent will really understand like this world, people and so on, and then it will get to NLP, for example, or maybe together, but but more or less there, because if we just skip from, from here to there, there will be so many skills that the agent will just miss, you know, and he will not understand the, the actual context that we don't want to do this. So this is one of the things that our project's uh, like disadvantage is that we are not aiming for short-term goals, and uh, we are just aiming for this long-term, you know, big jump. And uh, on the other side, I think it's, it can be an advantage because we are choosing what I think is the shortest path, you know, to get to this long, uh, long goal. Okay. Uh, good morning. You've talked about that you are developing a brain simulator and his second version. My question is, what's the programming language, C Sharp or so? Uh, will it be free? And what's the time road trip like when it will be done? 
Yeah, so this new one is mostly C++ for the simulation part. There may be some scripting support. We are just kind of like trying to um, decide which language will be there. Uh, but the visualization part is in C Sharp mostly and OpenGL and, and stuff. And uh, so what are the, like the main difference between this one and the first one is that this one uh, will allow us to process all the neurons in parallel and even in clusters. So this basically means that there will not be set order of execution, like you are going in, in some layers, you know, and they are ordered and so on. But basically we are assuming that everything will run in parallel in some kind of spiking neural network. But I want to emphasize that not like the biologically, you know, like STDP or something like this. So it's just like sending some signals, but we are assuming that they all can go in parallel. And the reason for this is that uh, uh, we are, w this way, we can be really exploiting the hardware as much as possible, that's one thing. Another is that if in the future we will go to some, uh, to some like hardware, specific, some neuromorphic hardware or something like this, uh, these things also run in parallel. And uh, so it's better if our models for neurons or connections or learning uh, rules, if they will already count with this kind of behavior and will be robust against that. Because if you don't have set order of execution, there can be some, some, some overlaps and so on. So this is uh, the main disadvantage that we kind of like uh, left the CUDA world because Brain Simulator was mostly for CUDA and this one is C++. And uh, what else is there? And if it will be uh, open source, uh, probably yes, like, like everything we do. And uh, uh, the timeline for release or something like this, I cannot say right now. It's it's really uh, like we just finished some, like basically the first stages. So now in, in theory it can run on clusters, you know, it has good parallelization and so on. But uh, it, it's probably a few months, you know, in the future. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, this long term and challenging goals and uh, mentioned also the one step forward and the 10 step back. So I wonder how difficult is to this project running? So I was lucky to, to already make money in, uh, in games. So I can uh, run this project for, I don't know, five years, 10 years or more. Plus, uh, we are still making a lot of money, you know. So I don't see any, any problem in financing this for, I don't know how long. Okay, so, so thank you, that was a very interesting talk. Actually, I wanted to ask you about your metric. Because if you are a speech recognition researcher like Shudong or us, we know that word error rate, you know, we want the best. If you are trading on stock market, you want to make the most of profit. What, what's your metric? What, how, how do you know that you are doing good or bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is interesting question in regards of how to benchmark AGI. And uh, to be honest, I don't have answer for this because there is so many aspects of intelligence. But one of the ways how you can look on this is, for example, how to measure something like transfer learning. So basically a being able to transfer these skills from one thing to another, to another, to another. Or maybe another, w another way how to put this, that how to measure ability of this incremental learning, that you will not start from agent who knows nothing to agent who knows you know, like the problem you want to solve, but you go there incrementally. And how to measure if you're actually learning this incrementally is that you try it with this brute force thing. So you start from nothing to the final problem or you go there incrementally. And if you go there incrementally, you must go there much faster, you know, because this incrementalness will help you to get there much, much faster. So this is one of the things. But at the end, how to measure the, the or benchmark AGI, I don't know, maybe, maybe like you know, who will own this universe is the, is the only measurement you need or something like this. No, I'm joking, but I think uh, there will be something like uh, we'll be able to measure how optimal is the AI in ac accomplishing its, uh, its goals uh, based on or by looking also how much resources is, is it using, what kind of error is there, how fast is it using. So I think these things together that in my opinion, intelligence is basically optimization thing and uh, how much you can get somewhere, you know, that's I think how you can measure, uh, how, you, how you can measure uni, uh, universal intelligence. Okay, we have time for the last question. Hello, okay. 
uh, very interesting talk, uh, very ambitious plan. Uh, I was impressed by the list of skills that, uh, that uh, uh, the algorithms or, or the AI should learn in the school. And there are many things that actually humans are also learning. And one of the things that, uh, that, that we learn uh, actually already when being very small is to distinguish between good and bad. And that actually helps us to set our goals while intelligence helps us to, to solve them, to reach them. Do you also plan to look into this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, uh, uh, it's actually funny because just yesterday I was reading the proposal for learning tasks, and the first one was to teach the agent. Like, we we are. It was it was it was a task for this language learning, and the first task was to learn the association between good, bad, and reward and punishment. You know, mm. so this is like funny question. Uh, but yeah, we will need this, and uh, basically, if the AI will have understanding about what is good, wrong, and then there will be this reward punishment thing inside. But here I want to emphasize that I don't really think the uh, reinforcement learning is the right way how to how to uh, train AGI. I think there are better strategies. So uh, it will need this. And maybe one of these be uh, better uh, strategies can be to incrementally learn behaviors, like one behavior after another behavior. So the agent will not be uh, seeking some cumulative reward in the future, but actually we will just use little reinforcement learning mm. processes or tasks to teach him one behavior after another. And then from this, uh, basically the entire, like this big behavior or his, his, uh, his uh, decision-making abilities, you know, will be kind of like emergently born. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.